to most of you for having surveys. <laughs> it's trying to balance both the survival advantage. So why do we do some of this operation? Why do we take out lung cancer? To make somebody live longer. Right? That's, that's the city. Long or short of it. Um, however, the cost of that is that they diminish their level of function quality of life. So it's always a balance between these two. It's very important to, to understand that. Um, and often we have to have this discussion about which choice are you going to make about those two uh, conflicts and goals. So unlike, say, orthopedic surgery, we rarely make anybody feel better. You know? Cardiac surgery, orthopedic surgery, the focus is on getting back to health. You don't do that. You're just trying to make a little long by taking out a cancer person. All right, so the objective of the session that I want to, to do here is to hopefully to um, do all to be an understanding class of digital teams, experience engaging patients, uh, which may be in our program of research and how it relates. Um, we have to describe the approach that you use and that may be of use to others. And uh, also to uh, share with you one of the, some of the lessons we've learned about the uh, outcomes that patients are uh, concerned about. So, so I already said what is the last surgery operating, operating on the chest. But it's also important to understand that this is quite different from what we may be familiar with, a lot of patient engaged in exercise and other types of um, medical care. Most medical care is often contacts of patients who have chronic diseases of some sort, have prolonged periods of care, multiple interactions with the physicians and the caregiver, um, often multiple steps of treatment. So things like rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, hypertension, even cancer, usually patients who have um, the chemotherapy and then long-term processes back and forth, back and forth. And also, there's you can also stop treatment, you can stop the drug, and you can't stop the operation. And so those are really important distinctions. And in fact, I think when we were looking through trying to figure out how to go go about um, doing the patient engagement, trying to understand it, that those are it was obviously difference, um, a major difference in how we interact because the timing of when we interact with them is uh, reflected in these. So. I'm coming at it not because the patient needs exercise. I'm coming at it because I have a specific research question. And I was interested in you know, how do we predict the likelihood of important outcomes for a patient? Because when I talk to patients, they actually ask me, you know, what's the chance of me getting better? What's the chance of me being cured of your lung cancer? What's the chance of me dying? What's the chance of me doing all these other things? And it's quite clear that I don't really have very good answers for that. Um, so, it's, so basically, we think that you know, we can give patients consistent medicine and risk for each patient. Uh, it's helpful. It helps them with the patient, helps them with the system. And at the end of the day, with, not, with better knowledge of risk, then it can just be made both at the patient and physician level and also system level. So to, under, to answer these questions, we were we are the person of trying to get the, a study off the ground called the Thoracic Surgery Health Outcome Study or TORCH. And the goal of this study is to develop a risk prediction model for patient important outcomes. That's what I'm going to talk a little bit more about. It's a prospective cohort study uh, with a goal of about 10,000 patients worldwide. And try to bring in more clinical and non clinical predictors because we think that in terms of a risk prediction model, we need to have a wide range of predictors. Now, clearly, um, this is a big undertaking. Um, and so, one of the things we want to make sure is that we have a, uh, as much as possible you know, lots of advice, lots of perspectives carry this uh, going forward. So, you know, one of the problems is that, you know, why am I? Again, yeah, why am I interested? Well, there are certain outcomes that are easy to measure. We're going to have a long discussion about you know, mortality. Pretty easy to measure. You know if somebody's dead or not. You can count dead, yes, no. And it's pretty unambiguous. Um, we can also measure complications to a certain extent. We can say, did you have pneumonia? Did you have an air leak after operation? Did you have a stroke? Um, 
And those are usually your reasonably good at capturing those in the medical uh, record. Um, but surprisingly, patients are not used, they don't usually think in terms of those complications. They're, they're relatively abstract until it happens to you. People all understand what it means to be dead or not, but they don't quite understand what the idea is. When they're attracted infection, maybe unless they've had one before or an air leak. So what does that mean? So those are kind of difficult, but that often patients say that's not what they're focused on. Um, they, they are certainly concerned about what, what impact in their lives, but it's unclear what kind of component of impact is. Is it pain? Is it not getting back to work? Is it not getting back to family, family activities? And, and also, it's also important what is the ordering of these important outcomes. And that's important for the, for the, model, uh, for the designing of the study because we're going to have the power of the study be effective in delivering the risk prediction model. So, uh, we want to focus on the important outcomes, which may not be common or maybe is common. So, it's really important to figure out because we can't choose everything. We've got to figure out what's the most important ones to focus on or uh, efforts on. So, I don't have to tell you guys what this is patient oriented research. Um, so, engaging patients as partners. So, that's a that's, that's, that's very important. And so we were very keen on having developing a partnership because we knew this is a long process. It's not just a one hour. Um, and we really want to focus on patient identified priorities because part of the problem is that sometimes when you talk about outcomes, you talk about results of an operation, uh, patients you know, not infrequently sort of look at you blankly and like something's not collecting. So part of the issue is like, you know, what's their perspective? What do they want to know about? Um, um, and also, basically, looking at other stakeholders like the family, right? and how do we try to improve this to help their system to practice? But I'll leave that to another time. But we also know what the patient engagement is. And we were using this sort of as a model for the, the UK version and the CIHR version um, to, to understand that. So ultimately, the reason for this project was to understand this like appropriate outcome for a planning study, or study, to gather patient input on the design of the study, because that's going to be very important. Because it's going to be a big, complicated study, so I want to make sure we have as much uh, perspective as possible. And to also develop a collaborative relationship with future research. And that's sort of the, the sort of the why. Specific objective we want to accomplish at the end of this project was. Uh, to at least have some sense of which outcomes are most important to surgeons, so that when we design our risk prediction model, we say the risk, predict, the risk of this outcome is this, because the patient said that is the outcome they care about. We also wanted some practical questions about what the extent of consent we required. 10,000 patients worldwide, how extensive the consent do they feel they need, because an observational study, not intervention. Part of the problem was that we knew that one of the difficulties we're going to have is when we do an ethics application, right? We want to have at least some extra information to say, look, we know this is a fairly brief consent, but this is specifically from specific input. And I think we, you know, from my experience before, it's a real one of the biggest challenges is making sure that consent actually makes any sense. You know, we challenge it to having it very well detailed to such an extent that it becomes meaningless. Versus, so we, we wanted some input on that. We also want to input on the process of data gathering. We want to make sure that patients were able to help um, their participation in gathering uh, study data. We want to make sure that it wasn't onerous so that it actually is practical. So some, so some of the ways that studies tend to fail is that you require too much of the patient participation, and you don't have enough follow up, you don't have dropouts. That is a major risk. Those are the major objectives. And I will now give this to Emma, who's going to tell us how we actually did it. Okay, 
so my name is Emma, and I was working with uh, Alana and Dr. Chinuko on this patient engagement project. Um, so I'm here to tell you about patient recruitment, our processes, and basically important considerations and learning steps that we experienced along the way. So the criteria for our patient engagement um, meeting, we basically included patients that had a proven lung diagnosis. So this varied from the diagnosis of cancer or patients that experienced trauma to the lung. Um, and that goes into our next point, which is unrestricted age. So we had quite a range in our meeting. Our youngest patient was 29, and then it went up to uh, quite elderly. Uh, and that the uh, age range really helped with um, including all lung diagnosis. Um, the older patients were more dealing with cancer. Uh, the youngest patient had experienced a trauma to the lung. Uh, we were inclusive of all ethnicities, and patients as well as caregivers were invited. So three or four of our patients brought along their caregiver. It was either family, friend, partner, um, and our group was Winnipeg Central. So we ran into um, basically a location issue. Um, few patients seen in clinic are from outside of Winnipeg, and they were given a letter of invitation, but it's hard to travel in for the meeting. It just wasn't feasible. Uh, so we were definitely Winnipeg Central. So we um, shared our meeting with the UK group. They were already already a previously established patient engagement group. They had quite similar uh, criteria to ours, but they had already met a few times, and a few of them traveled in for the meeting. So basically, for our group, we ended up with a purposeful selection of individuals who were really involved with their care. They were articulate in their needs, and they were willing to contribute their opinions. To so our process was actually quite short, and we ended up with a small convenience sample from the thoracic clinic. So our first step was developing a letter of invitation. Uh, the clinic nurse then distributed this to patients who were seen in clinic. Uh, we followed up with the patients who had the letter and discussed if they were willing to participate. Uh, and this is where we ran into the location issue with patients that were given the letter of participation and that lived outside Winnipeg. They were uh, very thrilled at the opportunity to participate, but it wasn't feasible to come in for the meeting. Um, and then we had the meeting. So we communicated with patients by email, telephone, prior to the meeting um, to discuss meeting location, answer any questions or concerns that they had. Um, and our important considerations. Uh, so greeting patients was a big one. Um, the place where our meeting was held was a different place than they'd come to clinics, so they were given directions to the building, but it was really nice to be met with a smiling, friendly face when they are shown up to uh, the meeting area. Uh, the people who greeted the patients were often the ones that talked to them on the phone, so it was a little history there. They felt like they were coming into a friendly environment. Uh, breaks between uh, meeting segments was very important in our meeting. Uh, through this, not only did it give the patients a break uh, from the core feedback session, but it also gave them a chance to talk between each other. So throughout the meeting, common considerations, concerns, or questions would come out, and between the break, they would continue to talk to each other. It was neat to see the little friendships that formed between people that had never met before. Uh, but they had discovered a commonality between them. Um, team involvement. So our patient engagement meeting was really a team process. At the beginning of the meeting, we had a shared meal. The surgeons were there, physician's assistant, clinic nurse, research coordinator, project manager, and it was really nice to share a meal together. It was uh, basically an icebreaker, and everyone got a chance to know each other in a comfortable, non-threatening environment. And that really helped moving towards the core feedback session because they were comfortable with each other already. Um, hospitality, so parking provided and the shared meal, and journal books. So at the beginning of the meeting, patients were given a journal book, and throughout the meeting, uh, they could write their feelings in it, concerns, questions, basically anything that wasn't a part of the core feedback session. And they were available to share it with us later, keep it to themselves, review it at any time. And it's also just a nice touch when they're going through the clinical process. A lot of the information can be quite overwhelming. So it's nice just to write things down, have time to process, think about your questions, and come back prepared. 
Uh, and then our, um, so our last uh, important consideration that I didn't put on here was also our lesson, lessons learned, which was the meeting space. So when we were planning where our meeting was, uh, there are things that you need to think of for the people that you're inviting. So a lot of our patient engagement patients were very elderly, so we had to consider stairs up to the building and stairs up to the elevator. Um, so a few of our patients had walkers, so we had to um, help them up the stairs. Uh, and then elevators. So the visitor elevator, since our meeting was after hours, the visitor elevator was closed, so we had to use the staff elevator. And basically, our last consideration with the meeting space was a safe, friendly, non-threatening environment, which basically helps with the shared meal, inclusion of friendly faces, and uh, an icebreaker before the meeting actually started. So, Dr. Shagavan has talked about the research uh, behind the project of engagement, I guess you could say, and has talked a little bit about the details of the meeting. Then we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of the materials we used and um, the feedback and recommendations that the um, patients and caregivers provided us. I also want to emphasize, um, and I'm not sure if you caught this, but there are two patient engagement um, experiences that are going on in this initiative. One is locally here uh, that we've put on, and the other is in collaboration with a team in the UK of uh, patients and caregivers. So our first challenge was to develop our materials and decide how we were going to conduct our meeting and then be able to transfer those materials, um, and luckily with a very um, well-informed group. But sometimes if you're trying to do this with other countries, for example, you may not have that expertise. But to travel, or sorry, to, to transcribe the materials across over into their arena and ensure that the same questions are being asked, the workbook is presented, and that not only are the materials acceptable for everybody, but that they're also effective in terms of getting what it is that you want to get out of the um, out of the, uh, the engagement experience. So just to back up a little bit, um, I want to talk a little bit about an engagement plan and the creation of an engagement plan. So being a project manager, um, an engagement plan or a project plan is very important because what it does is it's a guide and it's um, it's a guide that um, kind of explains um, what the rollout is going to be across the phases of, of your experience. So the initiating, the planning, the executing, and the closing. Um, the plan is also uh, shared with the research team, and it's agreed upon by the research team. So you're going to outline everything that you're going to do in order to um, engage patients and caregivers, in this case, family caregivers. And you're allowing your team to be very transparent in, um, in terms of what's going to happen all the way through. So they have an opportunity to have input and say, and also agreement. So the inclusions in a, in, a, um, in a project plan, or an engagement plan in this case, is the vision for engaging patients, the objectives, the roles and responsibilities of the team members, the meeting materials, the activities, the deliverables, and the costs. So quite detailed. So um, the second piece, of course, is the agenda. And um, the agenda is the introduction um, to the patient engagement um, plan or, or the meeting, um, how the meeting will flow, which address, um, which address the meaning and the importance of the PE experience. Overall, um, it provides a review of the research process, a presentation of our research program, and the core feedback core feedback session that um, we would be um, delivering to the, the um, patients and the family caregivers. And that's an integral, uh, integral component of the meeting and designed to elicit the feedback from members. So the agenda was set up um, in advance of the meeting so that um, members could have a look to see what it is that we were going to be uh, doing during the meeting. So then moving on to the core um, feedback session that consisted of an audio taped semi-structured interview 
uh, we decided that we would obtain uh, consent from members uh, for the audio taping. Audio taping is a little tricky. I mean, you know, you're asking people to um, verbatim record um, with their uh, feedback. So we felt it was important um, to um, ask for their consent. Um, in our semi-structured interview, we wanted to look at the physical, the psychological, and the social uh, parameters um, consistent with their well-being, including concerns and challenges experienced after diagnosis and prior to surgery for a lung condition. We were also looking at these same parameters experienced at different time points after surgery, at one week, at one month, and at three months after surgery. We also wanted to look at uh, the assessment of expectations regarding the return of usual physical and, and psychological state after surgery. We wanted to explore administration of consent uh, to collect outcomes uh, data, which uh, Dr. Srinathan had mentioned, and the feasibility regarding identification of quality of life questionnaires and, and um, interview with the surgical team after surgery. So feedback on when, where, and how do we do this, as well as recommendations. The workbook exercise consisted of a ranking exercise to score the significance of their experiences. So of course, one being the least and five being the greatest. Um, also, um, we wanted to um, provide members with an example of a typical symptomology assessment scale of post-surgical outcomes and ask them, what are we missing here? Are these, are these things that we want to assess um, important to you? Or are there others that we're missing? And we also provide the uh, space to record comments and written feedback. So again, saying that the same materials for both family and caregiver groups um, were required for us locally and in the UK. Um, and we're down, right? Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the findings from the analysis. What do we do with this feedback? Well, first of all, um, it was transcribed verbatim. So um, we wanted to ensure that the feedback was reviewed repeatedly for significant statements in an attempt to understand individual perspectives. Our analysis involved a pretty typical or qualitative approach to analysis. Uh, the um, uh, the, the um, picking out of units of meaning from the feedback, clustering units, and uh, forming thematic statements and extracting themes to gain an understanding of the patient and family caregivers' experiences at the four time points at the time of diagnosis, before surgery, and then at one week, one month, and three months after surgery. The workbook, um, what we did with the workbook was we, um, we made a list, created a list of all the challenges and, this, and the self-reported ranked scores in, into a table. Then we grouped them into relevant categories, such as functionality, specific symptoms, concern for self, and concern for others. Categories were then tabulated and presented in rank order according to the highest score as well as the, more, the most frequently reported categories in table format. And then this was followed by a grouping of each of the categories and tabulating the numerical rankings. So each level of the analysis was reviewed and discussed at subsequent team meetings with members of the research team. And then a summary report was generated. Um, and we took the feedback from the Winnipeg group and the feedback from the UK group and we combined it. And we shared that with the patients and the family caregivers for their review and input to ensure that the feedback was accurately represented. Very important stuff. So what did members have to say? Well, regarding physical impact, members were physically active prior to surgery. They could perform their usual activities of daily living and participated in their usual hobbies, such as golfing, gardening, and swimming. Those who were employed continued to go to work right up until the time of having surgery. However, the physical impact of the post-surgery experience was the most important consequence across all time points. So at one week, there were issues such as getting out of bed and performing self-care. At one month and at three months, shortness of breath reduced uh, the usual activity levels for members, such as 
the basic simple um, activities of walking and stair climbing. And also, they experienced the inability to resume pre surgical physical activities that required some form of exertion, like spraying, gardening, golfing. At three months after surgery, members were unable to return to their usual activities that required some form of physical exertion, such as swimming, climbing stairs, and walking in cold weather. The psychological impact. Experiencing the shock of the diagnosis was followed by anxiety and worry about its significance on self and family and facing the unknown road ahead. Members were less focused on the operation itself and more concerned with making preparations in anticipation of what might be the worst of outcomes from the diagnosis. Anxiety and worry prevailed across all time points for surgery, although ranked less as an, of an impact than the physical findings. Or physical challenges, I should say. Social impact. The social impact of the diagnosis was described as having a desire to isolate oneself from family and friends, not wanting people to know about their situation and evading discussion to avoid dealing with others' worry. So here, here are some quotes. So, regarding observing the shock of the wrong diagnosis, one member said, it was a complete surprise. I wasn't sick at all. It was just a fluke that I needed to go for a chest x-ray. And they said, you know, you don't have pneumonia, but who's looking after that mass on your lung? Well, thank you. I don't know, and it went on from there, but I wasn't ill at all. Isolating self from family and friends. I just didn't feel like seeing anybody because I didn't want to get into it. How are you? I am fine. It seems so pointless somehow. Feeling unprepared for surgery. There were questions I didn't even think about at the time. My father came with me, and these questions were already on his mind. How are you going to feel 10 years down the line after the surgery? Is there going to be any long-term effects? Something I didn't think of until we brought them up. I had, I had actually a piece of my lung cut out and I didn't realize that I would have shortness of breath, shortness of breath still. So, moving on to the importance of patient outcomes regarding the surgical experience. Overall, members felt unprepared for the thoracic surgery and did not know what questions they should be asking the clinical team to help them better prepare for the surgery. There were logistical concerns associated with hospitalization, such as getting to and from the hospital for appointments, as some members did not drive, and incurring the financial burden of traveling to and from the hospital and the parking costs for those who were able to drive. We really heard this from the UK group because a lot of those members were rurally based. We had to travel into their hospital. Uh, I imagine we would have similar um, issues if we had more rural uh, folks here in the province that had to incur these kinds of expenses. But even as it was, we did hear this from the Winnipeg group as well. Just the cost of parking alone, you know, to the to and employing from hospital is is uh, is a big hit, especially if you are not working when you're retired um, and don't have that regular income coming in. Um, there was significant concern for, for, their, for members' ability to return to work for those who were employed. Huge concern, um, actually. That was a real significant um, uh, challenge for folks that were employed. And they really, they really didn't know when. They didn't have an idea of when they could return. Um, so that was, that was a huge uh, concern. The lack of a cohesive aftercare plan inhibited um, their members' ability to exercise more autonomy for self-care. So this is something else that we're looking at is, okay, the patients come in and they have their surgery and they, away they go. But what does that aftercare look like? Where is the dialogue and the care planning that occurs between um, leaving hospital and going and moving back into the community, especially when you're pregnant with all sorts of different um, consequences of, as a result of the surgery? To better cope, members expressed how they would set a series of small goals for themselves to help regain a sense of normalcy. <clears throat> um, there were more physical challenges experienced than psychologic, psychological, and this was characterized by the decreased functionality. Trying to regain their sense of usual activity was very challenging. 
The inability to fully restore physical function after surgery is very problematic, especially when attempting to restore a neutral activity level and participate in activities that require some form of exertion. Members anticipated that the recovery would be quicker than it was, when in reality, recovery is much longer and accompanied with lasting effects that resulted in a lasting impact on their quality of life. So isn't this amazing what can come out of an engagement experience? of what people um, who experience, in our case, drastic uh, surgery, what is of concern to them, and perhaps a lot of what we don't know. It's, um, it's, quite, um, it's quite impactful. And these experiences are very, as, as people, as the team um, being involved in that kind of discussion and scenario, um, and hearing some of the feedback is very impactful, um, not only for the, those that are engaged in the process of accounting that they're going through, but also for those of us that sit and listen to some of the challenges and issues, and many of which we're not even really fully aware of. So moving on to the recommendations. Just as having good communication with your surgeon was emphasized, um, receiving additional support from um, social worker, supportive care nurse, the psychologist, um, and such, uh, was recommended to help work through the shock of the lung diagnosis and the resounding worry and anxiety that accompanied the diagnosis. Having counseling available would also help patients address the issues of social isolation. And this, these are recommendations that came from them. This is, these were their, their, our, our group's recommendations. Having counseling available would also help patients address the issues of social isolation, provide them with resources, and offer guidance to improve interactions with family and friends. Members emphasize that ensuring patients have a good understanding of their impending surgery, including being pres presented with guidance on what they should expect from the surgery and the potential issues they may encounter in the surgical they also wanted to be better informed about the types of activities they could engage in to improve the recovery, a more informed care plan after surgery, and better overall aftercare following surgery. And finally, greater attention to both the physical effects as well as the psychological impact of their surgical experience. Wrap this up. You can see this is a, uh, a multi-passer approach. It wasn't overly structured at the beginning. I think part of the thing we want to get is to let the patients uh, kind of guide us as to what is important. Going at it um, pretty well kind of way. Um, I think there's a couple of things that I certainly learned that I don't know about the surgeon. Um, things I've like followed years now. I always have this impression that I had a reasonably good relationship with them. Um, but it's, a, it's quite humbling to recognize how much um, I was happening that I wasn't really aware of. Because, in a way, this goes back to what I said at the beginning. About the nature of thoracic surgery compared to a lot of other easy processes. Usually, what happens is I would see a patient once, but they have a max or something. Like that. Then that's usually a pretty big shock for what I know. Then I may see them over the next few months or weeks, depending on exactly the disease, as they get worked up, as we try to prepare them for surgery, for the investigation, and you know, all that. Some of those are pretty. And I will see them in operation. That's a pretty big deal. And then I will see them on them while they're in the hospital. They go home, and I usually see them in a couple of weeks afterwards when I talk to them about what actually happened. So all this time, they don't know what's actually happened because we got a pathology back. So, so you can imagine kind of the intense peaks and troughs patients go through. Um, and 
to be frank, you know, my focus is not on all the other stuff. It's not focusing on the AVM. Um, uh, that's kind of what I do. <laughs> and time scales, and, and also I don't deal with them on a regular, you know, I'm not the GP, and so that's what it is. Another time. So those, those are the kinds of things that get to the context. So, but having said that, though, one of the things that this is part of why we did the patient engagement, I had sort of a big sense that we weren't measuring important things in the research, but I was aware of looking at outcomes of uh, the surgery. Um, there was something missing in terms of what we were measuring and what needs to be measured. So this, uh, you know, in some ways, it reinforced that impression that we were looking so, which outcomes are most important? Well, return to function uh, in terms of their own world view about what return to function is. So, we talked about work, but work is only part of it. A lot of patients are not actually working or at least uh, you know, paid employment. But people still work even if they're not being employed. They look after loved ones, they look after grandkids. And even though they're not paid work, they are, that's, that's what they do. So it's a, the importance of addressing that question uh, was really important. That's really helpful for me because now I can say, that's what I'm not a tort study, that's going to be one of the outcomes. When I figure out when, is, when do you return back to your work? Okay, so that's, and that's actually not something that we have in the literature. And, we also want to remember I said, you know, specifically what kind of the consent is required. Uh, they actually were very clear they wanted a minimal, wanted to get an idea what's going to be done. Um, what was actually quite satisfying is how many of the patients were completely convinced that this is a good idea. The study, the question was a good idea. They felt that it was important and they felt that it was something that really should should be done and there should be minimal structures to having it done. So that was really helpful because that was made it a bit easier for me to kind of pitch, you know, you're pitching for grants as you all know, right? Looking for grants, looking you have to convince a lot of people to get a study done. And it was helpful to have to be have some confidence to say, well, you know, the patients I'm trying to help actually are on side. So that was helpful. And being a little Little details, you know, input the process of data gathering. There's like a lot of time limits in 30 minutes. So that was good to focus our mind on, okay, look, I don't have, I can't ask all the questions. I have 30 minutes. I got to choose. And that was really helpful. Sometimes having limits uh, focus of the mind. And so I think that is helping us to design this study. And I think we also developed a great collaboration. And hopefully we'll be able to go back to this both here and in the UK. Um, I'm sorry I didn't quite clarify the UK issue, and, and I, I train partly in the UK and that institution, so that's how I know them. That's, so uh, I have the advantage of knowing that system very, very well, because I, I work there. So it was a matter of so we were able to sort of maximize. So, so, so you know, when I talked about getting parked, I totally get it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I totally understand how awful that was. So that's kind of the the, the, the point that I was saying. So thank you for your attention. Do we want to open it up for questions? Questions either online, questions online, or uh, or here in the room, Alex. Yeah. Um, I had a question around. Oh, it seems like in some of the data they talked about not knowing what to expect during the recovery. Could that have been an important outcome to them? Like they are feeling more prepared then. And knowing how that journey to recovery is going to be like mm -hmm. So I think so there there that's me, the question is to me. Right? The question, okay. well, or to, or to yeah. the team, like, would that be one of the outcomes? So, so I think, you know, what are the issues of, so I'm going to focus, so I'm focusing on, on, on the study, okay? So I know, you know, we're talking about, you know, the patient gave them like, different things, like, for, you know, as a good in itself, to get an understanding. So I learned a lot about how to look after them as a, as a, as a physician. So now I pay more attention to try to get that discussion. 
Uh, I'm not quite sure how that could be measured as an outcome for the study. We're looking at to say, look, you know, what are the risks of that happening, right? So the way that I would phrase it, maybe that's if that's the answer, is to try to figure out how to develop an effort. So for example, not so much you know, if you feel prepared, but now I can say, you know, your chances of getting back into full function are Forty percent or fifty percent, three months. If that's your question, yes, that will be that, that sort of focusing a bit on the outcome. So, for example, to be so one of the things we've done a little bit better is making sure that our, one of our outcome assessment tools is like the DASI version. You can can be scaling to that. So that's a really, really good marker of how well they function. So now I can say your chance of getting back into function is this. Sorry, did that answer your question? I'm not... I think so. I think I'm understanding the complexity because you're talking about the impacts of the oscillation. Yes. Not so much of the, like, of the interactions. That's right. Uh, in preparing them for what would happen. Like, it's almost like that would be the next step. Yeah. No, that, that's, that's right. You know, like, I, I'm coming, you know, I think part of the reason I'm here because I'm sort of, I'm coming at it looking at this whole process as you know as a means to an end which is i want to do this study and i want to do it as well as i can and i think it's important to me. so that's where that uh, you know the other stuff i'm like, probably not right and mostly not research related but in terms of how i actually function the position so so it, it did serve that purpose but you know if i kind of focus just on the objective of the right those three objectives it was more a matter of clarifying that really focusing on making sure that functional outcome is a major outcome for the study that has implications in sample size, has applications, you know, how much effort and resources are going to put into making sure I can understand that. So that was really valuable, like my point is incredibly valuable. That means I have to spend the effort to make sure I got that part right. I think some of the feedback. Um, that came out as a result of the meeting as well. I think it is enlightening uh, for service providers mm -hmm. that they can say, oh, wow, they don't feel prepared for surgery, so maybe our approach could be to, mm -hmm. to refer mm -hmm. uh, when folks come in at a system level, at a, care, at, a, at a clinical care level. You know, maybe we need to be on alert for those that appear in our assessment, A, do assessment, B, appear to be a little bit in distress and can be connected to social worker or someone to talk because clearly that was one of the um, one of the, the recommendations that they had offered is because they were not feeling very prepared um, that maybe there could be there would be better resources available made available to um, folks but so when they did come in and they were diagnosed with a surgery at least there would be something that could be offered and uh, so that's certainly something that we could take back from our experience of hearing what the members had to say about their experience and maybe look at the way in which the clinic is run, for example. And there were, there were I, I have to also um, emphasize that the team came at the beginning and they ate with us and they had all the beginning pieces. Remember, I talked a little bit about the breakdown of the agenda and what had happened, but they all left once the core session began because we didn't want to have folks surgeon in the in the room um, while we were doing the audio taping and the, and the, the really in-depth discussion so that they felt that they were able to express uh, freely, openly, you know, what their what their thoughts were. But I can tell you how wonderful of a surgeon. They, and the great comments that they had to say. I think that Dr. Srinathan is over and above uh, a caring, competent, excellent surgeon in terms of taking that time with his patients and developing that relationship. And they were all very, very positive um, about their connection with him. And that's in part why we're here today, being, uh, you know, uh, being uh, enabled to do this work is because of surgeons like Dr. Srinathan. Oh, question. Um, so, having had this experience in patient engagement, would you recommend it to other clinicians, other surgeons, other teams? Um, and you know, how how can we help promote that amongst healthcare practitioners? 
Well, uh, the answer is I would. Um, you have. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> and I have. And I the, in England, the UK conference yeah, yeah, presented. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, but I think, you know, I think the way to perceive it is, you know, it, it, the, the different people come at these things from a different, from a different perspective. I think, you know, it, 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 so it, it, it make sure I understand the, the gist of your question. The question is, how do we engage surgeons to do patient engagement? That's the issue. Then I think, you know, is to kind of um, say how it will help what the motivation, right? You know, I'll be absolutely frank, you know, my motivation, I did not come to give them quote, interested in patient engagement. It's like, you know, something that I have to do to do what I really love doing and want to do. You know, I spend my life doing surgery in my office. I want to do a good job of it. So I'm open to any way that will improve my job. Okay? Um, so that's kind of like the way I presented it, right? I presented it with a specific objective, a specific reason I do that. So there's a lot of other things that happen, which has been great. That's not why I started in the first place. So to answer your question, I think it is to be able to say how useful it is for something that most of us are are incredibly, you know, that many of us are pretty passionate about. Like, I really want to do this research project, but I say, look, if you want to do a good job of it, this is an amazing resource. You know, it's just as useful as you know, getting a grant. You know, even some of the simple things like, look, the chance of getting a grant is going to be better. The chance of getting a better protocol is markedly improved. The chance of you being able to say, look, how is this going to impact? Because Sometimes the patients will tell you what you should write about, right? So those are, you know, I know it's going to sound incredibly self-serving, but that's for, <laughs> I think that's what you have to go at because this is not, you know, you know, this is not an academic interest to most of us. You know, I'm, well, I'm hard to say because it's not actually an academic interest to me, just like I'm sure now you're particularly interested in the anatomy of the lung, you know, that's cool, right? But you all understand that I got to know how to do it, right? <laughs> Just like, you know, it may not be an interest to me, but I know I have to engage with it, I have to do it to do what my, my job. So I think it's important that to, to do that, approach it from that perspective. And that's kind of how what I've been done, doing with my colleague, and most of them get that. The risk modeling that um, we've been talking about in terms of the torch study, um, there's a real great area uh, and a great example of how um, the patient's um, voices have not been heard. You know, the risk model is fundamentally built on data and, and it's way less built on what's important to patients. And so the, the, the whole idea of engaging patients um, in um, for the feedback and then involvement in the development of the research study, looking at risk modeling and incorporation of patient um, important patient incomes, is is a huge step in terms of, of healthcare and, and how surgeons um, are able to sit down with patients and help determine what the risk level is going to be in terms of the outcomes of the surgery and um, that surgical procedure that they have. Are there any other questions, Catherine? Just really quickly, because I know we're at the end of time. Um, just, just, I've got three questions actually. Did you provide an honorarium? Um, how many people responded they wanted to be part of the group, and how many people did you end up with? And that group meeting was it was a group, it was a focus group that meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Uh, honorariums, yes, uh, absolutely. Parking uh, costs, honorariums. I can't remember what we fifty per person um, to attend the meeting. Uh, a group of 11 um, in Winnipeg, a uh, group of nine in the UK. Uh, recruitment window was very, um, I think it actually, the recruitment time when you're planning your meeting and you want to recruit. So that window is you're, you're going out to those folks um, that would be interested in participating in a period, a very uh, defined recruitment period. Um, we had very few uh, no's. They all, well, so they're very, very um, interested and willing to contribute and have a say. Um, only a few. I think we had two that said no, and they were outside of Winnipeg. Yeah, and then the UK group was already a preformed group, and they were a very established 
uh, group in the UK, one of their members actually sits on the involved national committee. Um, so they have kind of pioneered their their support group, their their PE group, um, and so they were already set and fixed. And we had nine attend that session. Yeah, did I? Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. The other, the other thing too is that I keep in mind is the challenge of what I'm really important to understand. You know, I recognize this, we're going to try to address it. <laughs> is that you already said you know, the timeline of these patients, right? But I really want to get an idea of the patients before they have their operation. So that's a pretty delicate time to start. You know, Get them sort of involved. I think about I, I feel a little bit better about having so well, the other thing is at least we got a better sense of having done this part, right? Is to now I think we, we can do a better job of trying to get capture those patients in that time period. Because one of the things I'm concerned about is how much of what they said that uh, they interpreted is sort of with the retrospective scope, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, they kind of forgot all the trauma that they were having. You know, people can forget awful things like more than a child in the world. All the trauma, I got, that's what my wife said. Anyway, so, you know, like, so what happened, what I worried about is did we capture what they were going through at the time? So I'm not sure. So I don't, so I don't want to get this impression, you know, I'm fully aware that their, their response is colored, right? Oh, we get it. So that's the other thing. So in terms of the timing, uh, so that's how again different from people who have chronic diseases. Like right? that before and after is a long jump to low key. Well, not low key, but then but in terms of the intensity of time, uh, remember a lot of things are happening to these people by the time I first see them to the time they have an operation done. Three day days of tests. Traveling everywhere, they're trying to sort out. You know, like a huge. You know, you got to remember. You know, for those who don't know the nature of the disease, it's the lung cancer, right? Bad, 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 bad. Related to the mortality rate, not very high. You know, survival. You know, all comers, lung cancer, five years survival, five percent. Right. So people know that when they come in. So this is a particularly intense group. Which I think, but to answer your question, is that I think that's sort of another way of kind of saying, well, these are, there are a lot of differences in surgical patients, especially who are going through, than the patients who are going through other diseases. So it's worth the effort to kind of get specific input from them, because I think those differences are different. Like, I mean, I trained both, in, you know, I'm actually trained in general surgery and cardiac. Patients getting thoracic surgery are quite different. They have different disease trajectories. So, we're going to talk things about. So, yeah, well, then oh. what Sadish is talking about, of course, is recall bias, right? Which is inherent in related methods as well. We are up against that when we do pure qualitative research. There's always a risk with when you're conducting interviews and stuff and asking people to recall events that there's a recall bias. That is why, in my mind, it is very important to make sure that even though uh, patient engagement is not involving patients in research that you do apply some rigor in what you do when you are conducting focus groups and you are bringing feedback. Um, you know, we didn't just take the feedback of three people that gave us a statement. We looked at it. We looked at the clustering. We looked, we, you know, read through the transcript and we applied a little bit of rigor to what the feedback was, so that when we say something about patients being unprepared, it had come up repeatedly um, from the recall that a number of patients might have had uh, in the experience. You know, the one ofs, okay, well, that's, you know, that's interesting and sorry that happened, or that's great that it happened, or whatever, but you're looking at, you know, in that group, you're looking at commonalities of issues because those are the commonalities that you have to take and then apply to a quantitative risk modeling approach. So therein lies, you know, always the risk. And when you're using qualitative methods and you're obtaining subjective um, feedback, you're always looking at that chance that there is a recall bias that is coming up. People will remember what they want to remember. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I wanted to thank 
Rich, Alana, Emma, thank you so much for your presentation. We're so privileged and thank you for sharing all your knowledge around patients that were engaged in all your great work. Um, thank you for everyone in the room who joined us online. Uh, the next Lunchtime Learning Series will be January 28th, 29th, 29th, January 29th, and it'll be on budgeting and patient and public engagement. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.